I'm Debbie Jester, and um, I'm going to do a tag team presentation here with the Assistant Secretary. So we'll go back and forth. You can't hear me. Um, talk closer to the microphone, or do we all want to turn it up? Huh? Chris? Oh, I could I could speak. Huh? You want me to use this? Is that better? Okay, thank you. So hi. Um, so today we're going to talk about what do you need, what are you entitled to, and how do you get it? What kind of mental health services do you need? And why should we even have to talk about it? Why are you in this room? You know, let's face it, let's face it, folks, if you had a broken leg or pneumonia, it's kind of basic that you get your leg set, you get treated. But with mental health, with complex mental health issues, we, we don't know necessarily what we need. Um, you know, they don't teach us that. Our friends don't necessarily know what we need. Uh, the treatment is not straightforward, but you are entitled to appropriate mental health care. And I, I was so inspired to hear what the assistant secretary was, was speaking to earlier, um, but there are so many barriers to getting it. So it's so challenging with a broken mental health system, with stigma, and the failure of health plans to provide the services that they're supposed to provide. So it's so difficult to navigate from needs to getting the services. And I hope by the end of today's presentation, you see a pathway to go from needs to getting the services, more than one pathways. Um, so my suggestion is to do your homework. In an ideal world, your mental health provider would recommend the needed medications and treatments. But unfortunately, sometimes they'll restrict their recommendations to medications on a limited formulary. Anyone have that experience? Um, economical treatments and low cost options. But is that enough? Well, sometimes it might be enough, but not always. So. I suggest that um, you consider NAMI support groups. That's a great place to start. How many here are part of NAMI support groups? Yay, I see a lot of hands. How many, how many in the Monday night support group? Let's hear it. Okay, thank you, love you. <laughs> um, you know, it's a great place to start. Every situation is different, but the collective knowledge of the group is so much more than any one person has. I learn and continue to learn from all of you. And so check the Greater LA NAMI calendar, GLAC calendar, and look for support groups. There are support groups for families and peers. How many here are family members? Okay, and how many here are peers? And we can be in both camps, right, can't we? I probably belong in both camps. Um, you'll get a lot of information from, from your friends in the, in the support group. And lastly, there's the internet. How many people, you know, raise your hand, don't do uh, research on the internet, but, but be careful, because, you know, do you believe everything you read on the internet? Um, I don't. I, I don't know if there's many boomers out there who remember the advertisements that Wonder Bread builds bodies in 12 ways. Anyone remember that? Yeah, okay. Wonder Bread builds bodies in 12 ways, and it never spoiled because it was so full of chemicals. Um, how about those people, always men in those days, wearing white coats, doctors who recommended one brand of cigarettes over another? Anyone remember that? Youngsters probably didn't. Anyway, um, it's hard when you're looking at the internet. You have to look for evidence-based. Uh, oh, I'm supposed to use this. I, this is my first presentation with a PowerPoint, so be, uh, be nice to me. Okay, okay so um, that's do your homework. Um, oh, let me go back. Apologize there. Um, look for evidence-based studies. What are evidence-based studies? These are studies that use valid scientific methods to study and research topics. They're peer-reviewed studies. It's kind of hard to, to know what you're looking for and read it. It would kind of be like if I went into the assistant secretary's office and got a legal book. I'd probably, it'd be a foreign language. I don't think I'd be able to understand much. So it's really a challenge for you to know when, when you're presented with some information, is it, is it valid, is it real? Um, so you kind of need to find non-biased resources. So many claims are bogus and, 
And you often hear people say, well, this worked for me. Um, you know, my son was a poster child, uh, use of one medication for negative symptoms for schizophrenia. And I told everyone about it. They all went and they talked to their doctors and I don't know anyone who worked as well for them as it did for me. So, you know, what works for one person doesn't always work for, for so, someone else. Um, if you do all of this, it doesn't make you an expert, but it helps you know what the right question is to ask. So then we go to what are you entitled to? And interrupt me, Assistant Secretary, anytime you need to. Um, you know, there's a mental health parity law, which the Assistant Secretary talked about. You know, you are entitled to the, do you want to say what, what, describe what the mental health parity states? Sure. Can you all hear me? Okay. Um, yes. Yeah, so under the federal mental health parity law, um, as I was mentioning previously, basically, um, just at its very core, um, it's that if a plan is offering um, mental health and substance use disorder benefits, it has to offer them in a manner that is no more restrictive than um, how they offer medical and surgical benefits. So one thing that you need to remember with respect to all this is that, you know, I, I deliberately said if a plan offers mental health benefits, um, because currently under federal law, um, now it may be different in states, you know, in California and in other states under for plans that are governed by state law, but the plans that we have jurisdiction over who um, are governed by federal law currently, there is no requirement under federal law that mental health um, benefits be covered, which is sad, but it's true. Um, so, um, but if a plan does offer mental health benefits, then it needs to offer them at the, at, in the same way. And there are, um, without getting into all the details, I'll just very high level say that there are financial limitations in plans. So plans, and that's a number. So if a plan says that it will cover five types of um, therapy for a medical um, condition, then it can't say, but we'll only cover two, five visits for therapy for a medical condition. It can't say, well, we'll only cover two for mental health. So a number or co-payments, those kind of things that are numbers. Um, but there's also non-quantitative treatment limitations, which are things that I mentioned earlier, like um, applying guidelines, um, having pre-authorization requirements, um, all of these things that are not really numbers, but are limitations nonetheless. And so all of those things are supposed to be on par when for a medical, um, mental health or substance use disorder treatment as it is for a medical and surgical um, treatment. And so it sounds pretty simple, but believe me, it is, uh, not, it's, it's not so simple when you come down to it, but I'll say, you know, just one thing, um, it's kind of a smell test. If you're, you know, if you're either advocating for someone, um, with a mental health condition or a substance use disorder, trying to get treatment, um, or you are in fact, you know, uh, a family member or uh, a patient yourself, if something doesn't sound right, um, I, you know, would go and seek help from, from an advocate or from, you know, an agency like, like ours, um, because oftentimes maybe there's a good reason why, um, something's not being covered, but oftentimes, um, there's really not a good reason and it's just getting to the bottom of, of what the problem is. Thank you. So, um, you know, check the benefit section for your insurance plan, it's sometimes hard to get through. It is for me. And what you're entitled to really, uh, a lot of that comes down to what is medically necessary. What is medically necessary for, for your issues, for your challenges? And the definition I follow, I believe, is, is it needed, appropriate, reasonable, evidence-based, community standard, and not requested for convenience? So just because there's something around the corner for you from you doesn't mean that you're entitled to go there. The you know the the office that the, that your health plan has, if it's in a reasonable distance, is where you need to go. Now I suggest that you familiarize yourself with the DMHC website. Now, what is DMHC? That is the Department of Managed Healthcare. 
In California, this is the Consumer Protection Agency that oversees the operations of most managed healthcare plans, both employee-funded, individual, and Medi-Cal managed plans and uh, Medicare Advantage. So that's more than 140 plans and 30 million Californians. We're gonna look at their website later so you can see how that can help you in, um, in going on this road, getting the services you need. Now I have some specific examples from that website of what you're entitled to with regard to mental health services. Have you ever been told, well, you have to be on this drug or that drug? Well, there are some extended, this is one example, there's extended release forms of drugs that instead of having to take three times a day, you just have to take a pill once a day. How many, how many of you forget your meds occasionally or very often? Okay, you know, and how about having to chase your loved one around who doesn't believe they need to take a pill and doesn't want to take a pill and might cheek it and pretend to take a pill. So if there's a medicine that you could just take once a day, that's a lot easier to, and the compliance will be much higher. So that's something that you are entitled to, even if it costs more. And it also it will have fewer side effects. More recently, ketamine. Anyone here heard of ketamine? Boy, this is, it's, it's not that new, but relatively new. It's not a first or second line treatment, but it is sure evidence-based for depression. And if the standard first and second line drugs, meds don't work, then you are entitled to ketamine. It comes in a nasal spray, lozenge, and injection. Well, your health plan is, is allowed to say, well, you should take the nasal spray because if it's, if it's injectable, they have to find someone that gives you the injection. So we have to be reasonable, and I think that's kind of reasonable. Um, how about TMS? How many people have ever heard of TMS? So that's a treatment where we pass, mag it's, a, it's transcranial magnetic stimulation. We pass magnetic waves and this is really a big advantage over what used to, what, before we had shock therapy, which was more difficult and quite, you know, quite different. Um, TMS was initially only approved for unipolar depression. When I prepared for this uh, presentation, I read that um, TMS is now approved for both unipolar and bipolar depression and OCD. So, you know, these things keep changing. Um, there's always new advances, there's new studies, and so what wasn't approved and allowed a year ago, six months ago, it changes. So you need to kind of try to stay up on reading what is out there and what's available so that you can ask for it, because it may not be offered, unfortunately. How about frequency of therapy? How many people have been told, uh-uh, you can't come once a week, maybe you can wait three months? I hear someone chuckling here. Yeah, so um, for serious significant mental illness, whether it's schizophrenia, bipolar, or maybe just anxiety and depression, you are entitled to weekly therapy, okay, if it's significant. And the part managed healthcare you'll see will, will um, advocate for you on that. Um, how about single, you know, one-on-one -on -one therapy versus group therapy? Sometimes, has anyone been told, well, you can only be in a group, we're not gonna offer you individual therapy, or maybe, yeah, you're nodding. Uh, group therapy can be great for some things, but not in place of one-on-one -on -one therapy. So uh, if they say, oh, you can be seen once every three months, but you can go to a group regularly, no. You can appeal and win. Um, next, we come to um, acuity of care. What that means is different levels of acuity. The lowest level is um, therapy in the, in the office and the highest level is uh, inpatient psychiatric treatment. Um, so obviously you're entitled to uh, therapy in the, in the office. If that's not enough, the next level higher are more intensive programs. And there are two of them, there's IOP and PHP, intensive outpatient programs and partial hospitalization programs. Those are programs that are hours a day, one to five days a week. And many people need that. If, you, if it's medically necessary, you are entitled to that. Um, one level up above that, if say someone needs more supervision and structure and they can't live at home, for the IOP and PHP programs, you live at home. If, you, if someone needs more 
supervision, uh, more structure like my son. The next level up would be a residential treatment center, RTC. That was mentioned in one of our earlier uh, talks. Um, how many people here are very familiar with RTCs? Okay, great. Um, one example is the John Henry Foundation in Santa Ana. And this provides long-term residential care for individuals living with schizophrenia and support for their families. Residents here live in bungalows. They have nutritious meals, daily groups and activities, on-site psychiatrists and therapists, and the most loving and caring staff you can find. I probably sound a little biased, but you're right, because my son's been living there for 10 years. Um, so you, you know, that's something that you are entitled to getting if, if you need that, that kind of structure. Um, if that's not enough, the next level up would be hospitalization. And how many people have heard, well, their insurance company won't cover your hospital stay? Anyone? Or the insurance won't allow you to stay in a hospital long enough to get stabilized so that you don't have to be in the revolving door and go in and out. So if the psychiatrist treating a loved one says that your loved one needs to stay in the hospital, the insurance company cannot cut off funding, okay? The problem is because there aren't enough beds and many other reasons that psychiatrists will discharge people routinely from the hospital before they've been, you all have seen that revolving door, before they're really stabilized and ready to be out and then they just go through the revolving door. I see a lot of you nodding. That's a whole nother issue, but the insurance company is not allowed to shorten your stay because they don't want to fund it. Just like if someone was in the hospital with pneumonia, the hospital wouldn't say after two days, oh, we're not gonna cover you till you're stable. Well, the same thing for someone who needs inpatient psychiatric treatment. Oops, pardon? That happens a lot, yes. We're, we're, and we're gonna have a lot of time for, for questions afterwards, but yeah, that, that does happen way too often. Now, during COVID, uh, sometimes the appropriate level of care wasn't available. And the DMHC ruled that if the appropriate level of care wasn't available, guess what? The insurance company had to provide a higher level of care. Unfortunately, a higher level of care are usually more restrictive, but, um, but you gotta get your needs met. And lastly, there's experimental and investigational treatments. They have to be covered if standard treatments have been exhausted or not are enough such as wilderness therapy programs. Now, I'll admit that I used to think they were awfully sketchy. I heard stories where people were kidnapped and physical abuse. Um, in preparing for today, I, I just read a lot of studies, uh, uh, success stories, and how there's evidence-based studies showing that these wilderness treatments really help turn around a lot of people, especially adolescents. Um, so examples, from the website of what uh, what you, oh, what you're not entitled to, I thought, here. Oh, yeah, so uh, specific examples of um, what you are not entitled to, again, from the website. How about newly released drugs? Anyone here every day on TV, these direct-to-consumer advertisements that this drug X is great for whatever? Um, newly released drugs, which I call the Me Too drugs, they're super expensive. And if they haven't proven to be superior to what else is out there, you're not entitled to them, okay? Cost hugely more money. Uh, and, and if they're not superior, that's the big, that's the big if. How about brand name versus generic? Let's be honest. How many people think brand name drugs are better than generic? Anyone think that? Okay. Um, generally, for a medicine to be, um, uh, produced as a generic medicine, they have to prove equivalent bioequivalence. So the blood level of that medicine has to be the same. So it's not going to get out there if it doesn't get, give you the same level of treatment. You're still going to hear some people say that, well, brand X works better for me. I don't know. I can't explain that, how much of that's placebo or, you know, it could be real. But in general, the gen generic drug is something that, uh, is gonna be adequate, the insurance company is not required to give you your, your favorite brand name. We're, we're gonna have some questions later, sir, if that's okay. Um, and then 
genetic testing for psych meds. That's a new thing people, uh, some of you may have heard about, doing a blood test and that tells you what psych drugs are working better. That's not yet covered by insurance company. It hasn't proven to, it hasn't proven yet that it will change the treatment outcome. So some people are getting it done, but the insurance company, according to the DMHC website, um, it doesn't support you on that. And then there's, you know, certain types. Some people are going to say, well, I want to keep taking my Valium for my anxiety. Yeah, Valium type medicines do work for anxiety, but there are safer medicines out there. So your psychiatrist is allowed to say, no, I'm not going to give you this for daily treatment. You have to try some other medications that are safer and not addictive. Um, so if I can, um, if I can just jump in. Um, so there's a lot of different acronyms you're hearing today, uh, you know, EBSA, uh, DMHC, um, you know, all different types of treatments, all of these different things. Um, and one thing um, that you should keep in mind is that with respect to the different um, agencies that oversee uh, coverage of um, health coverage, there are differences between those that oversee things on the state level, like the DMHC, um, and those that oversee things on a federal level, like um, the Employee Benefit Security Administration. So um, the good thing is that we try very hard to coordinate with each other because it may be, you know, those of us who work in this area, I mean, even, you know, I get confused sometimes about like who's, whose jurisdiction is this plan you know, under and who do I call, but we do work together so that if you just contact someone, um, whether it be EBSA, DMHC, you know, another advocacy group, you'll, they can steer you in the right direction um, as to who to call. So, um, so that's one thing. But the other thing to keep in mind is that um, state Govern plans and federal govern plans are subject to different requirements. Um, if you live in a state like California, um, there are you know certain protections that may not exist in another state and that don't exist exist under federal law. Um, vice versa, there may be some protections under federal law that um, are different than something in a state. But usually if it's under federal law, you know, even if it's a greater protection, it will apply. But but there are some things that under state law, state um, insurance companies are required to offer and under federal law, it might be different. So um, I do think that it's important to um, not make any assumptions and do your homework, as, as Debbie's saying, um, and read materials, you know, that you can access. Every plan should have either a policy document or a summary plan description, something that outlines um, what's covered and what's not covered. And then if a plan is telling you, whether it's an insurance, a state insurance plan or a federal, federally governed plan, if a plan is telling you that something is not covered, it's really important to understand why, because it may be that someone, as Debbie um, has said, has determined that it's not medically necessary. And then there's a whole process to go through to figure out, well, who decided that and why? Um, was there a difference of opinion? Was there not enough information given to um, the insurance company to make a decision? You know, prior to coming into this position, I worked with a lot of different health plans and we went through appeals and sometimes it was, you know, the, the doctor, the provider wasn't giving us any information about what this, what kind of treatment this person needed. So, um, so making sure that you like are, you know, working as much to get information in and also finding out, you know, is there a flat out exclusion of certain therapies? Um, or is it that someone's saying it's not medically necessary? And some of these exclusions are, you know, everything is evolving um, so much. So something that may have seemed experimental or no one heard of using this type of treatment for this condition a couple of years ago, um, times change. And so sometimes it's just an educational process for you with the plan to, um, to help them understand and see. I mean, I know that um, I worked with a plan once that, you know, we had an appeal come up and the person was getting medication assisted treatment for treatment of a substance use disorder. 
and it had never come up before, but the plan was denying it because 20 years ago, people thought that that wasn't the way to treat people with substance use disorders. And it was still in the book and no one ever questioned it. But once we found out that claims were being denied for that and that that was a 20 year old approach, then you know we changed the terms of the plan. So some of it is like just a learning experience between yourself and um, the plan, but it's, you know, that's easier said than done. So it's, it's great to be able to get these agencies or other advocates to work on your behalf and help you steer through that process. Yeah, thank you. So how do you get what you need, what mental health services you need? You have to ask and maybe appeal. If you don't appeal, I guarantee you're not gonna get anything, they win. So how can you win? Well, start with a, keeping a file, a paper trail. Keep all documents, reports, emails, et cetera. Write notes every time you talk to someone at the insurance company, get their name and title. Ask, you need to ask the provider, the case manager, membership services, the ombudsman, get everything in writing. And if they say no, get the denial in writing and then they have to explain and appeal. There's two level of appeals. One is internal, one is external. The internal appeal needs to come first. It's through the insurance company, they're in charge. And through the insurance company, you have to ask how to appeal. You, you know, put in writing or email these days. Ask who is deciding the appeal. Is it a person or a committee? What are their qualifications? I don't think we want a dermatologist deciding on something psychiatric. Um, what is the timeline for the appeal? Is it 30 days? Maybe usually they, they have to respond in a timely manner or they can get fined. Okay, and, they'll lose, and they will lose. Um, and when, if they deny, they have to say why, just like what the assistant secretary said, they have to say why. Do they misinterpret your request? Do they say it's not a benefit? Are their facts wrong or do they say it's not medically necessary? So if they deny your appeal, they have to give you in writing the denial and they have to say why you were denied, what their basis for the denial is. And then if they deny you, the next step is an external appeal. For most health plans, that's DMHC. And now we learned there's some more, more options for, for appeal. I'm gonna talk about DMHC because that's what I'm more familiar with, but I think it's very similar. Um, or you'll tell me where it's, where it's different. So, and we're gonna go on their website in just a bit and I'll show you how to navigate. Here, to go to the DMHC, you explain your case in writing, you provide all documentation, one page mental health summaries. How many have those? Yeah, that's kind of our Bible here. So you provide the one page uh, summary, letters from experts, evidence-based studies, anything you have of why you're, you need, your loved one needs those services. And then the insurance company is required in a timely manner to present their documentation and their reason for denial. And if they're not timely, they're gonna lose. And then what happens is you get an IMR, we're gonna come to that real soon on, on, on the screen, which is an independent medical review the DMHC will send your case out to one or three physicians with relevant specialty and scope of practice. They will review your case, these independent doctors, and they have the final say. Your insurance company will have to uh, accept their response. If they say, if they overturn the denial, you win. And guess what, that happens a lot. Would you believe, you're probably wondering, oh, is it really worthwhile to go through the DMHC? Anyone wondering that? Any people here feeling like, oh, is it worthwhile? Would you believe that in 2022, 68% of the time, 68% of the time you win, the insurance company's denial was overturned? 68% of the time, that's, that's pretty good. It does vary, we'll, we'll go, we'll go. Um, actually, I'll tell you now, it varies a little bit by insurance company, uh, for 2022 in California, health, uh, comparing HealthNet, Anthem, Blue Cross, and Kaiser, HealthNet was overturned three out of four times, 74%, not really great record. Anthem, Blue Cross was, uh, was average overturned 68% uh, of the time. 
And in this study, actually, Kaiser had a better, better numbers. 53% of the time, they were overturned. Um, so there is a difference in, in plans of, of, of how well they, they handle their, their appeals. So let's go step by step and see how this process works. Now, I'm going to need to operate this and not hold the microphone. Is Chris here to help me out? Is this, is this microphone loud enough? I can just project. Uh, okay. So if you have a search engine at home, you can just type in DMHC. And, um, and this is what you get. Okay. Uh, it looks a little different on PCs and, and Macs, but, but really it's pretty, pretty similar. Um, If you look on the far left, you see file a complaint. Okay, your insurance company denied you, you want to file a complaint. Um, just click on there. And it says here, if your health plan denies, changes, or delays your request for medical services, denies payment or emergency treatment, or refuses to cover experimental or investigational treatment, for a serious mental condition, you can apply. You can apply for an IMR, independent medical review, and then it goes down and it shows you exactly how to um, how to file an appeal. And the people on that eight 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 number, they are amazing. They are on your side. Um, they will walk you through it. If you need to go to another agency, they will refer you to that agency. They're on your side. They are wonderful. So let's explore actual cases to give you a sense of um, how are these cases reviewed. And we go to the data and research. Then we go to search IMR decisions. You can see that there. Okay. Okay. So here. Here we look at, at, it gives type determination and keyword. Type here, there's, there's two types we're gonna look at today. One is uh, experimental and one is medical necessity. So say you, your loved one needs to be in a residential treatment or needs something because it's medically necessary. Uh, type in medical necessity there. And then for, determ for um, determination go, shows whether it's overturned or upheld, whether insurance company is if they're overturned, you win. If it's upheld, the insurance company wins. And then key search word. Let's start by just putting in um, mental disorder. That's a broad topic, so it gives you more cases. And then you get this really interesting page. Chris, could you open this up so I can see the far right column? That's it. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay, so if you go, if we go to the top here, you see um, here we go. So you see a, a number on the left type that's like medically necessary or experimental determination whether it's overturned or not. If we scroll down on the overturn, look at this overturn, overturn, upheld makes you dizzy looking at this. Most most of all are are, are overturned, and then. Um, Severity is standard versus expedited. If you ask for an expedited appeal and you feel that a delay would cause harm or even death, you're entitled to an expedited a review, which will take a matter of days. Amazing. You, can get, you will get the response back in a matter of days, not weeks. Uh, the far column, let's see, Chris, how do I get this far, the far right column? So the diagnosis shows you their diagnosis and then um, uh, the treatment category, how do we go there? Okay. Um, you can see here, it could be mental health. It could be, a lot of them are RTCs. If you go here, you're going to see there's a huge number of, of, of times where families are asking for a residential treatment center. Now, the fact that there aren't many, there aren't necessarily good ones and there are not enough of them is, is totally different, but, but, um, I was I was amazed at the number of cases of individuals asking for a residential treatment. 
Senator, so uh, Chris, I am I am really struggling with this. Can well, I go? Good. I want to go go uh, okay. go to the left there. Okay. okay. Um, I, I, let's see how to, how do. Okay, sorry, folks, I am new on this particular computer. So we're going to go down to a particular case that I found. It's going to be four zero zero nine seven on the far left. And you'll see when we get to numbers, there's a little box with a plus in it. So guess what? If you click on that box, what do you get? Well, first of all, we see this, this case was overturned. If you click on the plus, you get a, a, a summary. So this doesn't tell you what insurance company it was. It doesn't give the name. I know my case is somewhere there. Um, but it tells you their findings and why, why they came to that conclusion. So um, in, in this case, someone that lived with severe treatment resistant depression. They were asking for ketamine treatment. Uh, they had failed many meds, TMS, shock treatment, and they had had success with past ketamine treatment. And the insurance company refused to continue to give them ketamine. Why would the insurance company refuse? Because they get away with it, right? So guess what? They were overturned. You win. This is an example of you winning. So. Um, Let's go down to another case. So if, you, if you're going to do an external appeal, I suggest going through this, which is what I've done to help people in the process, and study other cases that are similar to yours, see what the findings are, see what they're using, what their reasoning is, and then that can help you in writing your appeal and using terminology that, that is helpful. So we're going to go to another case here. Let's see, 23399. Sorry, this makes you dizzy probably when I scroll down. Um, 39924. Here we go. 39924. Here we go. So uh, clicking on here. So this is a case of um, a person asking for weekly therapy, which I, I talked a little bit about before. They want a weekly therapy. Uh, they were in extreme distress. They had a history of suicidal behavior, significant deterioration, had some medical problems. Um, they really needed some help. And they didn't want to be in group therapy, which the insurance company had offered. Duh. And guess what? The, the, the insurance company was overturned. You won. They lost. And they were entitled to weekly therapy and CBT. Um, now, CBT is cognitive behavior therapy. Some of you have heard of it. Um, that's something that is really helpful. Not all therapists are really perfectly trained in using it for people with severe mental illness. It's, it was first used for like anxiety and insomnia, um, but it has other uses and it can be used in severe mental illness, but most therapists don't necessarily have that training. And I researched DBT, which Dr. Ruhan here is gonna be speaking about a little bit later, which is a newer therapy. Um, hardly any therapists know how to use it. She's kind of unique in that regard. Um, it's evidence-based and I, I Googled in um, where at the very top here where you look at, uh, let's see, instead of putting in diagnosis of say mental disorder, when we go back to the uh, page here, uh, instead of, instead of um, putting in mental disorder, I put in DBT and guess what? All the cases where someone was asking for DBT, the insurance company was overturned. You won, they lost. I'm hoping to feel, give you, feel, I hope you feel empowered that you really can win. I'm gonna go through a few more of these cases and then I wanna uh, open it for, for, um, for questions. And it's kind of hard, I imagine it's hard to follow uh, all this uh, on, the, on the board. Um, Well, let's see, let's go back to, uh, well, I'm gonna go back to experimental here. So instead of medical necessity, we'll go experimental. Um, experimental, and then let's just do mental disorder. Guess what? Five, let's see, 400. Here's a case where someone wanted wilderness therapy. How many people before today really thought wilderness therapy was a bona fide treatment that really made a difference? Uh, I certainly thought it was 
kind of sketchy. Uh, but here's a case. Look at that. It was overturned. Um, someone, someone who uh, lives with bipolar had failed adolescent, uh, had failed um, standard treatment, wasn't doing well. The family requested wilderness therapy. Insurance company, of course, denied it. And guess what? The DMHC ruled that it was needed. So I could go over many, many more cases if, if you had particular questions about it, but um, but but maybe I'll we'll leave it for questions. So so I want to say what is the take home message? I hope it's learn, ask, appeal, don't give up. You have powerful tools to help you get appropriate services for you or your loved ones. Don't take no for an answer. You can win. And I'll, okay. <laughs> I'll just um I'll just add add to all of that. Um that uh if if you are dealing with a plan that someone has through their job, um and whether it's an insurance company or um, it's it's not an insurance company. It might be a, a more private uh, health plan. Um, and if you're dealing with um, with the EBSA and something that's governed by federal law, there is a similar external review process, um, like the one that Debbie mentioned. Um, it's not exactly the same, um, but. There are for most, I would say most plans um, would be subject to this external review process. Um, but it depends on the type of plan. It depends on the type of claim that you have. Um, but it's certainly something that um, if a claim is denied and that plan has to comply with these external review procedures, there should be um, included with the denial, not only an explanation of the reason for the denial, but also what your rights are as far as next steps and how you can request um, that external review. And um, we don't have anything fancy because we're covering the whole country. Um, so we don't have anything with like a library of decisions um, like Debbie is uh, showing that's super helpful. Um, but I would say that even though some of those, if you're covered under a plan that might not be under um, the state's jurisdiction, um, it's helpful to look at things like this so that you can see, well, if this was under the state, maybe, you know, if, if um, maybe it would be covered and how the person went about getting it covered. But again, um, at EBSA, if you contact us, um, if, if it's not something that we can help you with, we'll tell you, um, try to put you in the right direction. Um, but if it is something that we can help you with, we don't... Um, uh, represent you in your appeal itself, but we can kind of guide you through the process and um, and help you understand what the plan is saying and, and what your next steps would be. And a lot of the time, I would say probably more often than not, um, things may be able to be resolved even before going through the appeals um, process because Sometimes there's just a misunderstanding. Sometimes, you know, quite frankly, um, having been on the other side of things, if you get a, a government agency calling you and saying, why are you denying this claim? Um, then they think a little bit harder about why they're deciding the claim. Um, but, uh, but so yes, yeah, so these federal plans have a similar type of external review process. And some of these things um, can be instructive in trying to figure out how you're going to go forward with, uh, with proceeding with an appeal. So the microphone to do honor. Okay. Yes, we'll have about 10 minutes for Q&A. Um, I wanted to see if you guys have, uh, when the insurance is actually the nice person and trying to help you out. Um, you know, for me, when the pandemic hit, I hadn't been in, on medication for over 10 years. Pandemic hit, it's like I was rushing to find a psychiatrist. And the only one I found was outside of the United States, well, outside of California, I was in Hawaii. And then he was helping me find someone locally. Finally, the insurance uh, company found me a, a psychiatrist. But recently, they, um, the office said that they could no longer help me. They could no longer see me. I call my insurance company and say, wait, are they out of network in the network? They're like, no, they're in network. 
but again, I keep fighting because I want my doctor and you know how hard it is to get a doctor that knows you already in medication and stuff. So I wanted to see if, what if it's backwards? What if the insurance is helping you, but the, uh, and the doctor's like, hey, uh, this is out of my scope of practice, uh, deal with a front office, front office is like, no, they're out of network. I call them up. Uh, so, so I wanted to see if there's, there's, yeah, a, there's a tough problem. There? There's a tough problem. Thank you for that question. There's a tough problem because when we don't have enough providers, we don't have enough therapists who are, who are adequate. We don't have enough therapists. We don't have enough psychiatrists. So there's a problem with resources. Department of Mental Health has a whole bunch of openings for uh, for psychiatrists and therapists. Um, you can demand that they provide you a psychiatrist that has open that has access, because very often they'll give you a list of twenty. 30 providers and no one is taking new patients. Has that happened to anyone? Yes. So you document how many people you call and if the insurance company won't provide you with a list of someone with open access, then go to DMHC or you know go somewhere because they have to find that. You can't necessarily say, well, I, I saw the psychiatrist in the past. I want it. If, that, if you're in an insurance plan, you are generally required to go to someone in plan. If they cannot get someone in plan, then you are entitled to go outside and DMHC will help you. Answer questions. Take. I'll just. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, I'll just say in general, all of this conversation should be had with providers for the RTC operators. You know, I've been doing this for 20 years in the provider position as well as a family member, um, and I've never heard about this. And you know, I have a family member has Aetna. I went out on a limb, and you know got the authorization, utilization reviews every four days, and then three months later, they will pay nothing. So I might be naive, and I was videotaping all of this, and I've already said to them to hopefully reach out to your department. Um, but for all of the individuals in this room, I, I feel like what's a missing link is the, you know, informing providers about this so that they can help family members when it comes up. And also with well, I'm sorry, when you say providers, you're referring to the therapists, the psychiatrists, the RTCs. So um, John Henry, Synergy, Encompass, like all of the ACUA, uh, National Psychiatric, all of the places that say, no, I'm sorry, your insurance didn't cover this. Uh, I think we would do more and put ourselves out on a limb had we known about some of these things where families can, can fight it. Okay, just, let, me, let me just interrupt you. I have helped families who are in an RTC fight to get insurance. I think Anthem was the last one to provide, to pay for, you know, retroactively. Um, but, but unfortunately, the problem, and I don't know if uh, Assistant Secretary has some solutions, the insurance companies put the RTC through so many hoops coming up with documentation and documentation and, and all this so that it takes a huge amount of time for the RTC and they don't want to deal with this right. because they don't have the personnel mm -hmm. to do that. So that becomes a, a big problem and I don't know what the answer is. So I, I just think that providers, the RTC providers, owner operators, corporations could be informed more about this and educated to help family members. And also I want to mention with the, um, the gene site testing, our doctors have written TARS and have gotten them approved through Medi-Cal, um, somebody who's treatment resistant. Um, so yeah, there are some cases, but it's still not considered evidence-based. So many insurance yeah. companies will, will not cover it. That could change. Medi-Cal, Medi Medi Okay, that's evolving, that's evolving. Yeah, it is. Yeah, I'll just um, add to that, that we are, we are reaching out to provider groups as well, but I do think that it, it it's a very good um, it's a it's a very important point that we all need to be working on this together. And there are lots of things that providers could be doing, and whether it's because they don't have you know the the information about what they are going to have to pro provide in order for the you know, claims to be paid, or they don't understand the process, or they don't have adequate resources. Um, you know, as is mentioned, a lot of times it's, um, you know, it is just kind of getting all the information in front of the insurance company from the beginning and knowing how to present it and what information they'll need. So, but we are trying to, um, you know, reach out to 
medical provider, med mental health providers also to, to let them know, um, you know, what resources are available to them. Yeah. Uh, hi, my name's uh, Steve McNally. I'm from Orange County. Um, I love the presentation because you taught me a lot of stuff. And for both of you, um, I think it would be really great for NAMI and other organizations to teach, uh, since we we are very motivated, and maybe your websites do this, so this is what I'm going to ask you to speak to. Um, how do you teach us to be the investigative, uh, play the investigative role to capture the data to bring to your short staffs? Families have time, families have mission, but families don't know how to collect, and it's a very indifferent system. And then a second question would be, when you went through Department of Managed Healthcare, Medi-Cal is shown as a provider, like it's so that I put in CalOptima, will they pop up? And what are the denial rates for Medi-Cal versus private insurance? Okay. Pure pure Medi-Cal is, is not going to be uh, on on this. If you like uh, LA Care, Los Angeles Care, that that's. Uh, but if it's if it's ma Medi-Cal managed, then that 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 is, I believe, uh, in under DMHC. And I don't have the numbers, but if we we could look at it right here, uh, uh, if you look at the health plans on the top, each health plan. If you're thinking of ch of changing your health plan, you go to the top, look under health plan. It compares the rates of health plan. It compares the number of complaints. It, it compares the uh, uh, I, uh, number of IMR reviews, how many are upheld and how many are denied. So you can compare health plans on this site, if that helps answer your question. Oh, we have time for a couple more questions. Hi there, my name is Selena Rahim. I'm with Centered Health up in Culver City. And so I was, when I was listening to your presentation, which is an amazing presentation, I just learned so much from that, just as the gentleman did. Um, you mentioned that there wasn't enough like RTCs. So my job is to actually uh, work with the referral partners, such as Dee Dee Hirsch or Nami and yourself to be that liaison. So in case somebody's looking for an RTC for insurance, I mean, looking for a particular one, uh, do you have like somebody there who I could, you know, like we could work with who would be that source or that partner if they're looking for a residential treatment center in a certain particular area? Yeah, just find me afterwards. I, I have to give, I guess, a disclaimer. I'm on the board of directors of John Henry, but, but right now we only have 42 beds and they're all filled. We need more RTCs, right. so, okay, and they have to be affordable. They have to be affordable. I mean, how many of them are, are really affordable even if you find one who can afford it? If you have pure Medi-Cal, it's not gonna be covered. So, so that's a problem that they're not affordable. And if not, that's where I could come in and work with you also as well and refer those partners. Uh, you, uh, Hi, I'm Shelly Hoffman. Uh, I'm a NAMI uh, family support group facilitator for NAMI GLAC. You could contact NAMI GLAC, who put on this program today, and provide that information that they can send out. GG, yes, that's good because if they have that information, they could provide it to the membership and the support group leaders who have other people. Hi, I'm Cynthia Sirota. I'm a, a resource navigator. I'm a support facilitator as well as NAMI Westside. And I get so many calls from the peers that cannot get therapy. It's not approved. We don't have therapists. They can't get their what? They're, they can't see anyone. Oh, therapy. therapy. They can't get into therapy. Everything is denied and they're suffering so. So what are you doing to help them? And also, can we get this recorded so we could share this with all our NAMI families? 
I, I gave a similar presentation last year and it was recorded. Um, it was somewhat different, but you know, see me afterwards. I can do, I'll do it again and again great. and again to get the message to across. Janice Black Warner speaker series. It would be fabulous because you are wealth of ener energy and you have such knowledge. I would really appreciate this. Thank you. I'll come up and see you. And I, but how do we help the, the people that need therapy? Well, I mean, I'll, I'll just say one thing. I think that one thing we can take back on the EBSA side of it is we do a lot of um, outreach, you know, public outreach and uh, meetings, webinars, different things like that. So um, we can talk with NAMI and different organizations about, you know, what additional resources um, would be helpful. But um, I do think one thing is just, you know, an issue with the, with the number of providers and it's, um, you know, sort of this circular problem. You know, we're hoping that with having um, more strength in the laws so that providers, you know, are going to get paid fairly and are willing to, and are going to be able to get claims covered, that that will result in having more providers available, but that's not going to be an overnight, you know, solution to the problem. Like Edelman off Olympic, they didn't have anyone for therapy for the longest time. There are not enough therapists. DMH, Kaiser, everywhere they have openings for therapists. That was a, a doc, a, a Mr. Gale, Dr. Gailey address that. We're, we're working. We need to get more therapists. We need to get more therapists. We need to get more providers. It's there's we need, and we need beds. There's just so many things there. Yes. Uh, hi, um, my name is Zebra Tidwell, and I'm a parent of Nami. I'm going to support groups and teaching classes. Um, I just said. It was a great presentation, but you mentioned the thing about TMS is now being covered for patients with bipolar disorder. And my daughter was just denied about a month ago. Wait, is that a California or? Is okay, it this federal? is a, a California. It is um, evidence based for um, bipolar and unipolar depression. And it's not first line. So if they've tried some meds and they haven't worked, DMHC, overturn, overturn, overturn. You'll win. And so thank you for that. But the other question is that, you know, that diagnosis was given to her in 2016. And she's seen, I don't know how many psychiatrists and been hospitalized, I don't know how many times, but everyone said that is not her diagnosis. So how do you also get a diagnosis changed when it was given like a long time ago? Is there uh, anything for that? You need to, you need to get a, an after diagnosis by a mental health provider. You, know, you have to get an evaluation. Diagnoses change. You know, sometimes someone just thinks they have depression. They take an SSRI. Suddenly they're manic. Oh, they've got bipolar. Things change over time. It doesn't mean the first psychiatrist was wrong, was bad. It just means that it, uh, you know symptoms change and evolve. But you don't need to get an adequate evaluation. You're entitled to an adequate evaluation by a mental health you know pr uh, provider. And and so then if I'm we not a mental health provider. I'm, an, I'm a general internist, so I, I can't. Yeah, right. That. But then if we present that to our health insurance and say, this is the new diagnosis, then they have to accept that? I'm just curious. Do you know? If the diagnosis has changed? If the diagnosis has changed and, and, and a psychiatrist, you know, a, a psychiatrist has said the person now has has a borderline personality or bipolar, then, then that's their diagnosis. Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry, but uh, we've run out of time. Um, but um, if you have questions for Debbie or uh, Ms. Gomez, uh, please feel free to ask them now. Um, I'd like to put a uh, survey on the screen that uh, you can scan with your phone, uh, with your camera, and please uh, give your feedback. We'd really appreciate that. Thank you for your time.